Hello and welcome back. So today I'll be covering a missing persons case that dates back almost 30 years. And it's not a simple case. There are many twists and turns and so many strange events that happen and very strange people indirectly involved. And given the last couple of videos I've recorded that have involved all sorts of brutal, horrible murders and serial killings, I have to say it's good to take a break from that to cover something a little bit more toned down. So this story takes place in Vancouver, British Columbia, located in the lower mainland region of the province. Vancouver is the most heavily populated city in the province and has the highest population density in Canada, with over 5,400 people per square kilometer. Over the years, Vancouver has hosted many international events and conferences, including the 1954 Commonwealth Games, Expo 86, several matches of the 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup, including the finals at BC Place in downtown Vancouver. The 2010 Winter Olympics and Paralympics were also held in Vancouver and Whistler. Vancouver is said to be one of the most livable cities in Canada and in the world. In terms of housing affordability though, Vancouver is also one of the most expensive cities in Canada and in the world. In 1994, Vancouver became the center focus of one of the most mysterious disappearances in Canadian history. This case reminds me a lot of the murders of Barry and Honey Sherman that occurred in Toronto in 2017. There was a lot of money involved, a lot of problems, and a ton of rumors about what could have happened to this Vancouver couple, but absolutely no proof. Today I'm going to be covering the 1994 disappearance of Nick and Lisa Massey. Back in 1994, the night before they vanished, Nick and Lisa Massey turned down an invitation from friends to watch the Symphony of Fire fireworks display in Vancouver's English Bay. Instead, the North Vancouver couple said that they had an appointment to go to on that evening. A mysterious meeting is scheduled between the married couple and a businessman from the States. This mysterious stranger was apparently interested in investing $10 million in a company that Nick was involved with that traded on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. The mystery man sends a limo to pick up the director of the company and his wife, planning to meet at a local restaurant in town, but the meeting never happens and the money is never invested. Nick and Lisa Massey have been missing since August 11th, 1994. Lisa met Nick Massey in 1984 when she was a 29-year-old hairdresser at Yakoi Hair Design on Camby Street in Vancouver. Nick, who was an account director at the Bank of Montreal, was one of her clients. They eventually got married and moved into a home in North Vancouver. This was the second marriage for both of them. And Nick was born in the Netherlands and had two children from his first marriage, Nick Jr. and Tanya. By all accounts, the couple seemed happy with their lives. They lived in a modest North Vancouver home and enjoyed traveling to their timeshare in Hawaii. So Nick had a very interesting past and it all seemed to revolve around money. So after Nick and Lisa were married, they became well known within a group of socialites called the Howe Street Crowd. Howe Street was once home to the Vancouver Stock Exchange, also called the VSE. Back in 1989, Forbes magazine famously called the VSE the scam capital of the world. So I had never heard of the Vancouver Stock Exchange up until I started researching this case. Apparently it was founded in 1907 and was one of several exchanges set up at the time to trade in booming mining shares and became Canada's leading exchange for mining juniors in the 1960s. After trading standards toughened up in Toronto, following a fake gold mine scandal that caused stocks to collapse back in the 1960s, which wiped out many investors and sparked a massive Ontario Security Commission's investigation, junior mining companies and promoters moved to Vancouver. In the 1980s, the VSC was heavily criticized for corruption, organized crime, market manipulation, money laundering, and scam artists. 
So essentially, it was just a whole bunch of pyramid schemes. So in the 80s, even though the Vancouver Stock Exchange was trading at its highest ever volume, it was well known that investors were better off putting their money elsewhere. Because making money on the VSE was a dream that literally no one would reach or very few people would reach. And nine times out of 10, those people were super shady. In January of 1994, Nick Massey had retired from his job as head of private banking with the Bank of Montreal, only eight months before the couple disappeared. Nick had worked for the bank for 35 years and was the private banker for some of the Vancouver Stock Exchange's most notorious stock promoters, including Murray Pazim, Harry Mall, Nelson Scalbania, and Herb Capozzi. This sounds like a group right out of The Sopranos. Nick ate with them regularly at high-end Vancouver restaurants. He also went on weekend fishing trips to the Sonora Lodge with them. He flew on their private jets to boxing matches in Las Vegas and stayed at their Scottsdale mansions. He was also a guest at Murray Pazim's wedding that took place on a luxury yacht. At the time of his disappearance, Nick served as the president of the Netherlands Businessmen and Professional Association. His son, Nick Jr., said that his father enjoyed the Howe Street life and made no secret of that. Nick Massey knew his way around the Vancouver Stock Exchange and was known to invest in his clients' deals. Before the Vancouver Stock Exchange disappeared in 2001, it boasted that it was the third major stock exchange in Canada, raising a billion dollars in venture capital. But in reality, it was little more than a legalized gambling joint. Scams were everywhere, and they usually involved fake shell companies that began as a fake gold mine that would morph into a bat sanctuary, that morphed into video vending machines, that morphed into real estate, that morphed into a biomedical outfit. In 1991, the VSC listed about 2,300 stocks. Many years later, it would be discovered that the majority of these stocks would either be total failures or frauds. A 1994 report by James Matkin of the Vancouver Stock Exchange and Securities Regulation Commission made reference to shams and swindles and market manipulations within the VSE. Regardless of this, the VSE had about $4 billion in annual trading back in 1991. Besides the disappearance of Nick and Lisa Massé, the Vancouver Stock Exchange was also linked to a bunch of bizarre mysteries, including the unsolved murder of stock promoter David Ward in 1997, who was shot execution style while sitting in his Jeep. The vehicle sat there double parked with its lights on and the engine running in Vancouver for 11 hours before anyone found his body. Apparently, Ward also had a checkered past with the Vancouver Stock Exchange. In 1989, he was sent to prison for three years after pleading guilty to stock manipulation and making secret commissions. One of the biggest players on the Vancouver Stock Exchange was a character named Harry Mall, totally out of the Sopranos. He would promote companies that would inflate and deflate, screwing over all his investors in the process. Mole was infamous as the boss of the Pine Ridge Capital Group. The company ran several sketchy startups, including a company called Cross Pacific Pearls, which Harry Mole publicized would grow the world's largest pearls in a Honolulu shopping center. And nobody thought this was weird. Of course it didn't. It was a total scam, and the Pine Ridge Group imploded in 1992. And this sparked one of the many inquiries into the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Harry Mole was kicked out of the VSE and fled Canada to take up residence in the Grand Cayman Islands. So people actually do that. I always thought it was a myth that people run away to the Cayman Islands when they're in trouble. And Nick Massey was one of several closest friends who attended his going away party at a small Italian restaurant before Harry skipped the country. One of the biggest players who did make money from the VSE was stockbroker Murray Pazim, who was known in the Howe Street crowd as someone who would push get-rich-quick schemes to anybody who would listen. 
He was also another one of Nick's clients who lost as many fortunes as he made. His two biggest gold discoveries were Hemlo in Northern Ontario and Eske Creek in Northwestern British Columbia. He was also a former owner of the BC Lions football team. And then there was a character named Fred Hoffman, who also fled Canada with $10 million that he made running a Ponzi scheme. Macy was friends with Hoffman and also inadvertently introduced Hoffman to one of his victims. Nick Massé had been a top-ranking junior tennis player and he still loved to play. One of his tennis players and associates from his banking days was Nelson Scalbania. He was a rich stockbroker who owned a $2.6 million jet, a luxury yacht, and the Vancouver Canadiens Baseball Club. Apparently, he also signed Wayne Gretzky to his first professional hockey contract as well. He was a flamboyant promoter who was always in the news. During his career, Scalbania earned notoriety for flipping properties. Apparently, throughout the 1970s, Scalbania was known for flipping more than a thousand properties annually. And at the time of Nick Massey's disappearance, Nelson Scalbania was on trial for misappropriating $100,000 from a former business associate's trust fund. Nick Massey was also scheduled to testify as a witness for the prosecution. But police told reporters that Nick was only a minor witness in this trial and that they didn't believe the court proceedings had anything to do with his disappearance. So Nick and Lisa were what others would call house streeters. They had an in with this crowd of very colorful, dangerously wealthy, and unsavory characters who really didn't care about anything unless it made them money. When asked about Nick, Pazim was quoted as saying, he knew everything about the street, but he had no street smart. He might have got himself into the wrong place at the wrong time. And when asked whether Nick's disappearance might be related to Vancouver Stock Exchange activities, Pazim replied, could be, I don't know, but I'll tell you one thing. Number one, it's money. So these relationships were basically a weird combination of the dull banker and a den of rowdy promoters. One of Nick's former bank colleagues was quoted as saying, Nick was basically able to get away with it because it generated business for the bank. But while Nick and Lisa may have associated with the rich and the powerful, they were living way beyond their means. As a banker, Nick brought in about $85,000 a year. They had a modest North Vancouver home that was heavily mortgaged and they owed about $70,000 on their credit cards. Lisa worked at the hair salon about six days a week, and she also took private clients at the house. On top of this, both Nick and Lisa both had passports from different countries. So although Nick managed the investments for the stockbrokers, he wasn't in the inner circle quite yet, but he planned on changing that. At the beginning of 1994, Nick retired from the Bank of Montreal. He was 55 years old and started working as a director for a company called Turbidine Technologies, a California-based company that traded on the Vancouver Stock Exchange in 1994. The company was apparently developing new technology to cut emissions from diesel engines. Then, on August 10, 1994, Nick and Lisa told several people that they were going to Trader Vic's a popular Polynesian restaurant located at the Bayshore Inn in Cole Harbor. Nick was planning to discuss a $10 million business deal with an investor whose identity remains unknown 28 years later. That same day, Lisa told a co-worker at the salon that she and Nick were meeting with the potential investor that evening at 8.30 p.m., Nick told one of his business associates about the meeting as well. According to one of Nick's business associates, Nick had said that the investor was going to send a limousine to pick up the Massays at their North Vancouver home, but nothing else was known about the meeting. Nick made a reservation for four, but nobody showed up at the restaurant or called to cancel, which the restaurant staff felt was odd behavior for Nick. 
This was another sign that something wasn't right, because Nick would have called the cancel. According to a 1995 news report by the CBC, a witness said that they saw Nick and Lisa next door at the Weston Bayshores Garden Lounge from 6.30 to 10.30 p.m. Nick was wearing a jogging suit and they split a bottle of wine. The details of what happened afterwards are unknown. On the morning of August 11th, on Lisa's 39th birthday, she made two calls from Nick's cell phone. One call was to her boss, and the other one was to one of Nick's associates, Leon Nowick. She said they would be going out of town for a few days, and they were never heard from again. Lisa was known as a punctual and hardworking employee. So when Lisa failed to turn up for work, her boss called Lisa's sister, Loretta, because she felt immediately something was wrong, as Lisa had worked for the salon for eight years and had never done anything like this before. In a Vancouver Sun article dated August 27, 1994, Leon Nowick is said to be the last person to hear from Lisa Massé before the two mysteriously vanished. Quote, she phoned me on the morning of the 11th and said that they were going away for a few days. I was on the other line and didn't think much of it. Her voice didn't sound distressed or anything to me. She said Nick would phone in a couple of days. Within a week, Lisa's sister went to check on the Massays at their home. She found the door was unlocked, the security system was off, and the couple's car was parked in the driveway. Spider, who was the couple's 17-year-old cat, had been left inside the home without any food. Okay, that right there is a sign that the couple was in trouble. Nobody who was an animal lover would ever leave their pet without food. Nick's son was quoted as saying that his father cherished Spider and would never have left him without food. The Massey's passports were in their bedroom and two plastic zip ties were found in the front entrance. So Lisa's sister filed a missing persons report with the North Vancouver RCMP. The rest of the house was untouched. There was no sign of a struggle and no sign of forced entry. North Vancouver RCMP Sergeant Jack Awart said, quote, There is no real starting point. We are trying to track down shadows at this stage. We are classifying it as a suspicious missing persons case. We have to keep an open mind. There is no evidence of a forcible kidnapping, but it's getting more suspicious as time progresses. So the police investigation begins with very little to go on. So the police basically came up with a bunch of different theories. They started searching for the mysterious banker that Nick was supposed to meet up with, hoping to talk to them. According to a 2001 letter filed in court by the RCMP, Two theories were being investigated at the time. The first was Nick and Lisa were the victims of foul play or that they had orchestrated their own disappearance. And then there are some people that believe that Nick and Lisa are in the witness protection program. It would seem that Nick and Lisa were happy and successful, but those who knew them began to believe that they were acting strange. First, they took a trip to the Cayman Islands in April of that year. They didn't tell anybody that they were going, and Nick and Lisa set up a bank account there with $50,000 worth of stock. And they also drew up wills. However, since Nick and Lisa have disappeared, that $50,000 has never been touched. And most concerning was a call that Nick made to his daughter who was living in Holland to say that he likely would not be able to call her on her birthday. Nick didn't disclose where he was at the time and didn't offer any other explanations. Also in 1994, Nick allegedly told a friend that he was in trouble and needed to leave Vancouver. So it's possible that they were planning to flee Canada and then something or someone happened. In the meantime, on August 29th, 1994, Nick Massey Jr. announced that he was conducting his own investigation into his father and Lisa's disappearance. 
He flew in from Singapore, where he was living, and was quoted in the Vancouver Sun as saying, I actually spoke to my father just a few days before he was last heard from. He also said that his father gave no indication that he might be going on a vacation and that their disappearance has come as a surprise. Then on August 30th, another article in the Vancouver Sun speculated about possible links to gambling debts. An individual named Adrian Duplass, who was referred to as a Howe Street insider, said that he heard Nick Massey may have innocently provided a verbal guarantee for the gambling debts incurred by a Vancouver stock promoter. Apparently, the RCMP had heard the same thing, but refused to comment on the rumor. But Nick Massey Jr. was adamant that his father wasn't involved in anything shady. Quote, There are a lot of rumors flying around, and everything's been positive in terms of my father's reputation, because there's nothing to suggest he's done anything that would contribute to his current situation, whatever it might be. I don't think there's anyone in the city who could point the finger at him and say he's dirty. Herb Capozzi, one of Massey's former clients, said, quote, He's as straight as an arrow. He's the kind of guy who, if he won money at a poker game, he would claim it on his income taxes. Murray Pazim told the CBC in 1995 that he had heard all kinds of crazy stories. One was that Nick had been cemented, or put away. And then there are other stories that Nick is alive and just in hiding. But Pazim's favorite theory was that the Massays were in the witness protection program. Quote, I think he's alive and the police know where he is. Former colleagues who spoke off the record said that Nick was well regarded as a banker and his resignation was entirely voluntary. A Vancouver lawyer who was close to Massay said that Nick claimed to have made only one bad loan for $25,000 in the past 10 years. Quote, Considering who Nick dealt with, it's a miracle his accounts were so clean. And there was speculation that their disappearance could be linked to another case. A man named Nelson Scalbania, who was on trial for theft of $100,000. Nick was supposed to testify at the trial as Massey had dealt with Scalbania on several business matters. Nick had been subpoenaed as a crown witness. However, Massey had been described as an incidental witness in the case and was not viewed as a co-conspirator. In 1995, Nick Massey Jr., announced that he was putting up a reward for $25,000 to try and find out what happened to his father and stepmother. Quote, I'm willing to put forward every dime I have in the bank. I'd like confirmation that they're dead or alive. In July of 1997, Turbidine, the company that Nick was a director for, left the VSC to trade on the NASDAQ. At the time, Nick vanished Turbidine Technologies was priced at only 50 cents a share. In 1995, the price increased 10 times to $5 a share, and then tripled to $15 a share in 1996. Apparently, the stock was propelled by the stunning announcement about prospective sales of the company's emission control devices for gasoline and diesel engines. Before Nick disappeared, he acquired 25,000 shares. At their highest value, those shares would have been worth $375,000. However, in August of 1998, Turbidine Technology shares plummeted. After a New York-based short seller blasted the stock in a research report, quote, There is no factual or reasonable basis to believe the company's earning potential exceeds a market capitalization of about $700 million. In fact, we believe this false perception has been purposely cultivated by management in order to defraud investors. This report also said that despite raising and spending over $55 million in equity, Turbidine has failed to create new products. We see no asset or future earning potential that can remotely support Turbidine's current stock prices. 
I don't know, the more I look at this, I have to wonder if this whole mess is something to do with this company, that maybe Nick saw something that he wasn't supposed to see. In August of 2000, six years after the Massays had disappeared, the police publicly admit in a Vancouver Providence article that they believe the Massays are most likely deceased. However, the rumors at this point still persisted. There were also rumors that the Massey's disappearance might be linked to the disappearance of Fred Hoffman, another Dutch Canadian with links to the Vancouver Stock Exchange who disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Hoffman disappeared in 1991, leaving behind more than $10 million in debt and the shattered lives of elderly victims who trusted him with their money. In October 2001, Nick Massey's children and Lisa's sister Loretta petitioned the BC court to declare them presumed dead. It's been almost 28 years and still no trace of the couple have ever been found. The press tries to keep the story in the spotlight. Every year, the Vancouver Sun publishes a story about the disappearances, hoping someone will come forward with some information. In July 2019, Nick's children and the North Vancouver RCMP held a press conference calling for any information about the couple's whereabouts. For a quarter century, secrecy has blanketed the disappearance of North Vancouver's Nick Messe Sr. and his wife Lisa Messe. To mark the 25th anniversary, Nick Massey's senior's children, Nick Massey Jr. and Tanya Massey van Ravensvai, are renewing their appeal to the public for help to lift the veil of silence that has left them confused and heartbroken these past 25 years. The evidence surrounding the disappearance of Nick Massey Sr. and Lisa Massey was never quite sufficient to lead investigators to say conclusively that they vanished because they were victims of some sort of crime. We've had uh, lots of discussions and meetings over a long period of time with the North Vancouver RCMP. We're very confident that they've made every effort to investigate anything that was uh, readily available, but it's uh, become obvious that um, there is nothing that they can immediately find. So on behalf of the families that are affected by this, we're calling for anyone that might have information regarding the disappearance of our father and his wife Lisa to come forward uh, with information to the RCMP. The reward for information was raised to $50,000. And although there have been no new leads in the case, investigators say that they believe Nick and Lisa were killed for reasons unknown. Nick's children and Lisa's family are desperate for answers. Not everyone thinks that the Massays were victims, though. Nick's son had previously hired a private investigator called Ozzy Caban. He believes the couple are alive and well, likely living in a foreign country. He said he talked to witnesses who said the two were making plans to leave town in the days before they disappeared. Mr. Caban has since had a falling out with Nick Massay Jr. and would not identify these witnesses. Quote, there's a chance he may be dead, who knows. But at this point, my gut feeling tells me he's alive. Nick Massey Jr. said his father lacked the bravado and the ruthlessness needed to stage a phony death. He said he was straight-laced, conservative, and took very few risks. Meanwhile, a former RCMP officer who investigated the Massey's disappearance says he found no evidence to suggest that the couple left the country. John Shersak says he thinks the couple were killed. The disappearance of Nick and Lisa Massey from their home in 1994 is North Vancouver's RCMP's biggest missing person case. But they really don't know if the Masseys are intentionally missing or were caught up in a VSE stock scam and murdered. RCMP's Gord Reed is keeping an open mind. Quote, it's a head scratcher. I've got missing people that I assumed are murdered because they are not the kind of people who would be able to disappear. But the Massays could. He was a sophisticated guy. They both had passports from other countries. They had lived around the world. He understood international banking and they had some money stashed aside. Which brings me to the end of this mystery so far. 
but someone out there knows something. If you have any information about the disappearance of Nick and Lisa Massey, please contact the North Vancouver RCMP. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.